Good afternoon and welcome to this virtual panel session on the Royal Commission, a final countdown. I'm Jane Bacco Kilpatrick, Jane BK, and I've had the privilege for the past two years, almost to the day, of leading Laser's project to support you through this Royal Commission. None of us involved in this panel, you are watching live on Friday, have cheated with our predictions, as all contributions were pre-recorded because at this very moment, the council assisting team will be presenting day two to the commissioners on recommendations that the council assisting team propose the commissioners should take in their final report. That report is due on 26th of February next year, which is 18 weeks away. So we asked a panel of laser members, all of whom have given evidence to the Royal Commission for their top predictions on what will be in the final report and recommendations. Each was limited to high level thoughts only and two and a half minutes of time, so it had to be targeted. I know that each of them will have had many more ideas on what they would want to share. I've had the privilege over two years of watching and commenting upon almost all the hearings and papers published by the Commission and have been connected to you as you have navigated what has been at times forensic, painful, and a long drawn out review into our sector. The conclusion for all of us, things need to change. But what will these changes be? This has been a time of introspection. And I've also taken the liberty of considering what would be my top picks. So to quote a favorite film, 26th of February and beyond, what do I see? Well, I see a new Age Care Act. The current one is past its sell by date and no longer fit for purpose. I imagine something like an Aging Well Act, which does what it says on the tin. Of course, this would take some time to get organized. So I imagine also a multi-phased approach to change, starting with some interim remedial urgent uh, action with funding and recommendations coming to address issues, for instance, of access with more home care packages for sustainability in the residential care sitting to ensure that there is service continuity during the time of disruption as the new foundations are built. And on issues of quality, which will probably be tied to some sort of expectation on staffing. All of these ideas have been muted during the hearings. And I then expect alongside these to be a deliberate transformative program of change. Thirdly, I see an overhaul of system governance. From the stewardship of government with a capital G, the interfaces between governments and also of agencies, and then to the local level at how governance occurs at the provider. Now, I'm gonna to pass to our panel of speakers. And today they include Sandra Hill from Benitas, Chris Mamarellis from the Widden Group, David Panter from ECH, and Kerry Rivette at Royal Freemasons. Each panelist has presented to the Royal Commission, sometimes on multiple occasions, and each has kindly agreed to share their high level predictions. Following this, you will hear from Sean Rooney, our CEO, who has led our engagement with and advocacy to the Royal Commission during this time, and who will add his predictions and some closing remarks. I will hand over to the panel and then to Sean, and want to say thank you to you all for your contributions and your support during this period. Number one, remuneration of direct care workforce. Change in the industrial landscape over a specified period to remunerate the direct care workforce and equivalent pay rate to that of the acute health sector. Number two, residential services staffing model. Within three years, all providers to attain a minimum three star rating under the current CMS staff star ratio. Within five years, 70% of providers to have achieved a level four star rating. And number three, 
home care packages, redistribution and redesign of care packages to provide six le levels of packages with a greater focus on supporting people with higher care needs to remain in their home. The three big things for me in terms of the, the work of the Royal Commission so far and what I think is going to loom large in their uh, report and recommendations. First and foremost, it's already there within the interim report. It's the focus on human rights and the application of a human rights lens to the way in which we are providing um, support and services to people as they age in this country. Um, and that is critical um, and we are going to have to look um, with an, an open mind as an industry as to what does that mean for our current processes and practices um, because unfortunately like the rest of society we suffer from ageism uh, and that sometimes prevents that human rights uh, approach coming to the fore. So a big focus on that human rights lens to the way in which we provide services and support. Secondly is the separation of care from setting and the assessment of an individual's needs such that whether they're at home or they're in a residential aged care facility, um, they're treated equally. Um, and again, that's already been indicated that that is something which the Commission have spent some time looking at. Um, and I think we're going to have to see out of the Commission some equalisation, some balancing of the system that, as I say, separates out that sort of care from the accommodation or the setting uh, and that people are getting the right services regardless of where they choose to live. Uh, the third point is probably the area which has been least articulated by the Commission to date but I think will loom large in their final phase of work and that is the whole issue of who is regulating the, the aged care system and is it one body, is it more than one? Um, there's already talk about an independent pricing authority type mechanism. We've obviously got the Safety and Quality Commission. There are issues about registration of workforce. Um, and so I would expect there to be significant issues around the regulator and regulations within the aged care sector within the final report. Thank you, everyone, and thanks for that lovely introduction. Well, we're here today to talk about the likely outcomes of the Royal Commission. Now, that's a huge question. And I've been asked to try and stick this, stick to actually three predictions. Okay. The first prediction, and I don't think this is a prediction anymore, because I think the Minister's come out and actually said um, that we're likely to have a, some adjustments or a new Aged Care Act. So that act is likely to have increased compliance in it. Um, I'm thinking that we might move to a more deregulated market to open the market up. And there's going to be more about increased consumer choice being legislated. The one of the other issues is workforce. We're going to see more standards around the workforce, what the work workforce looks like, you know, what does the workforce can contain and what's the training of the workforce? I think we're going to see minimum standards around training and mandatory training um, as well. The other big thing we're going to see is around governance. We're going to see more compliance around it. And we're going to see that directors are going to have to be more accountable. We're also going to see changes around quality and safety. I think we're going to see more around quality and the need to have outcomes such as KPIs that we need to meet, benchmarks and standards, and a more focus around quality of life. So I hope I've kept that to a minimum, and I thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Mamarellis, Widden CEO. These are my three predictions to come out of the Royal Commission following my appearance at the hearings in Perth last year and more recently in Sydney this year. Community care will receive more funding and we will likely see the emergence of the Level 5 package. 
I believe that this will provide far more substantive opportunities for the providers of home and community care, allowing for business growth, new models of care and more innovation in this space. Importantly, there will also be material implications for providers of residential aged care. Occupancy is an obvious one. Having appeared at the hearing into aged care funding, I'm confident that more funding is on the way and will either be announced during the May budget in 21 or sooner, depending on the political environment. Based on my experience with the hearing, I believe that in the medium term at least, if not sooner, increased levels of funding will be anchored to staffing ratios or maintaining a set of performance standards or possibly both. This was certainly explored in a lot of detail. There may also be incentives built into the funding model for those providers that deliver real innovation and genuinely evolve their care services. And as someone who is very passionate about regional, rural and remote care services, there will be recommendations to reform the funding mechanisms connected with regional services. Various alternatives were explored that appear far more equitable to those in place today and the evidence illustrating that our current systems are broken was compelling to say the least. I believe we're going to see the emergence of two independent third parties who will significantly impact aged care funding and will be as influential as the Quality Commission is on our industry today. Firstly, we will see the introduction of an independent pricing authority who will oversee aged care funding similar to IPART that will hopefully result in fair, transparent and consistent pricing policy and this will see the current approach anchored to the annual COPE reviews made redundant. And secondly, it's looking far more likely that the individual individual assessment process attached to care funding, the ACFI of tomorrow, will be conducted by an external independent third party. This last point has the benefit of freeing up our precious clinical teams, although it'll be interesting to understand who this is outsourced to, the resources they will be given, and how they'll keep up with providers' needs, reappraisals for example. So they are my three insights and I'm going to remain optimistic that there is too much at stake for another set of recommendations to be ignored. Thank you. Thank you to Kerry, Sandra, uh, Chris and David for sharing your predictions for the likely outcomes from the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. Uh, it's interesting to note that in reflecting on uh, the predictions you've made that they align pretty well with the initial terms of reference uh, that were set for the Royal Commissioners way back in late 2018. Uh, I guess when I consider what I think is going to happen with regards to the outcomes of the Royal Commission, uh, my uh, predictions can be summed up in one word, and that word is more. Uh, that is, that uh, I believe the Royal Commission's recommendations will likely result in more of the following. I think there's going to be more expectations. Uh, the expectation is we're going to get a better aged care system a system that's rights-based, that's person and relationship-centred, and that focuses on quality of life outcomes. Now, realising this will require more transparency on what is provided and how it's delivered, and what difference this is actually making in improving quality of life. And this has implications for understanding outcomes at the client and the resident level, understanding uh, outcomes and performance at the service level, and importantly, also understanding those outcomes and performance at the system level. And this will also include the reconsideration of the measures of performance by providers, uh, by the regulator, and also by the government. Uh, to deliver on this, we will actually require more resources. And you can read that as more staff and more funding. Now, my hope is that uh, more staff will be determined really by aligning staff numbers, skills mix and qualifications to quality of life outcomes that can be measured. Uh, this will enable the providers to innovate and uh, as they deliver against agreed quality of life outcomes and they can employ uh, new models of care, new technology and innovations in order to realise those outcomes. Uh, further, more funding will be required to deliver on expectations and better care outcomes and more staffing. Uh, more funding will also require transparency in how these funds are being used and what outcomes they are actually delivering. And this funding is likely to be determined by an independent pricing body that will look at what is the appropriate level of subsidy, 
based on evidence aligned to those care outcomes. And then uh, my third prediction is that as the population ages, we will require more services, more services to meet holistic care needs and growing demand. Now in practice, this will see more care delivered in people's homes, uh, in community settings and in residential care homes. And this care will be expanded to embrace, uh, further embrace mental health, oral health, allied uh, health care, pharmacy, primary care and acute care alongside more activities and services that contribute to well-being and overall quality of life. Getting the system settings right to accommodate a significant upscaling of more services will require careful planning and careful delivery in order to match resources, the staffing and the funding to increased volumes of demand and expanded types of services to meet this demand. So uh, there's my three predictions. I would say that um, with all of this will come more change. Look, it's clear we cannot stay where we are as a sector or as a system. And although we may look longingly uh, back to the, the past, where things were a simpler time and things seemed so much easier, uh, this too was not an option. As such, our focus must be squarely on embracing the changes to come, staying focused on realising better outcomes for older Australians. Because in realising better outcomes for older Australians, doing that well will realise better outcomes for your organisations, better outcomes for your staff, and indeed better outcomes for the nation. So there's my uh, three predictions as to what I think uh, the Royal Commission's uh, recommendations will likely result in. Finally, let me also leave you with the thought that what I hope uh, is also for the Royal Commission to recommend not only what needs to change, but also how we realise that change. How do we implement it? Uh, it's going to be significant change. In, in fact, Going back to the statement that the Royal Commissioners made at the conclusion of the first hearings that they conducted, uh, they are promising transformational change. And what this will require is not only what is recommended, but also being clear about how we will realise this in an effective and efficient way that brings the sector along, brings the nation along and ensures that the intent of the Royal Commission as outlined at the start of the journey, is translated into meaningful actions that deliver those outcomes that older Australians need and deserve, and that the organisations and the staff that care for them also need and deserve. Thank you.